problem with work is your manager is bad at their job. My name is Kadeem Peters. I've middle managed. I'll say that it wasn't difficult, but I wasn't trained at first. You kind of get thrown into the position, especially dealing with out in operations. You learn as you go. I feel like I'm a calm people person. Um, you can come talk to me if there's an issue. The first time I was managing a group of two cleaners, a mailman, and the front desk office uh, receptionist. We had an issue with the two cleaners, which I felt wasn't an issue. One worked morning shift, one worked night. They worked their schedules so they can have lunch together. I was fine with it. My senior manager, who was also very micromanaging, she felt it wasn't conducive to the company. She told me to address it. I did address it. I said, hey, if you guys are going to have lunch, make sure everything you need to be completed is completed before you have lunch so we can just keep a smooth day like we always do. But they still felt like this was an issue, and they went above me and put a sign on the cleaning door like no one in this group can have lunch together. I felt like if you're my manager, you should come talk to me because you put these people under me to make sure everything is done. When we meet in our meetings, you don't bring it up, but everything was completed. I went through a lot with that manager. I think micromanaging is the worst kind of management you can receive. When you're being micromanaged, you can't grow. Your ideas aren't heard. I'm not going to lie. The first chance I got to leave, I took it because of the stress it was putting on me, because I didn't want to put that stress on my team, I decided to leave the situation altogether. Sometimes you choose not to fight in those situations. Sometimes you just have to take yourself out of the situation. That was Kadeem Peters. He's worked as a middle manager for an apparel company and a men's grooming company. And his story is all too common. Often people find themselves in management roles because they were good at their job, but they receive little or no guidance on how to manage others. In turn, their managers also never received management training and in many cases are just making it up as they go. If you're lucky, you end up with an emotionally intelligent manager who takes it upon themselves to figure out how to work best with the people they manage. But more often though, people ended up in a situation like Kadeem's, stuck in the middle, doing what they think is right with no guidance or frustrated by a boss that doesn't know what they're doing. And the story usually ends like Kadeem's too, with someone quitting. But what if we treated management like the important job that it is and invested in making sure when someone is promoted that they have the tools they need to succeed? This is Fast Company's The New Way We Work, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor Kathleen Davis. The theme of this season is the problem with work, and one of the most universal problems with work is bad bosses. In fact, of the hundreds of episodes we've done of this show, by far the most popular was a December 2021 episode with Dr. Tomas Chimero Premizik titled, Why Your Boss is So Bad at His Job. In that episode, Dr. Chimero Premizik detailed how, as a society, we associate personality characteristics like charisma with leadership skills when it's often a sign of narcissism. We focus so much on style and so little on substance. You know, a lot of the times when we see people who are charming and they're fearless and they come across as charismatic, that also accidentally selects for a lot of narcissistic individuals. Not that if you are charming, charismatic, comfortable in social scenarios, you are necessarily narcissistic, but a lot of narcissistic individuals and psychopathic individuals, they're very charming in short-term interactions. They are fearless and they are performers. They're very shrewd when it comes to manipulating others and saying, you know, pressing the right buttons. But personality isn't the only reason why so many people dislike their bosses. Or, like Kadeem, why around 50% of people say that they've quit a job because of a bad boss. So why are so many managers unable to effectively manage? And is there a way to learn how to be a better manager? 
To help me answer those questions and more is Leah Bosch. Leah is the founder, managing partner, and coach of Thrive People Strategies, a consulting firm that helps to make a productive and motivating work environment. So let's talk about our experience as managers first. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. How long ago did you first become a manager and what was it like? What was the learning curve like for you? Was, did you get any training, mentorship, support, mistakes you made along the way? Well, Kate, you're taking me back um, more than 30 years now. And it was a pretty scary experience. It was exciting, but it was scary in the sense that um, I was young. I was working with a bunch of my colleagues who were friends prior to having been promoted into that role. So I was in a situation where I was certainly concerned about how they were going to receive me as their manager. I had some great mentors. The training was pretty much on the job. As I became a more experienced manager, I did have opportunities to develop my management skills, not only through some formal programs, but also through my education in the organizational effectiveness field. And so I feel that uh, certainly I've grown quite a bit since that first experience. How about you? Yeah, I, I said I would I would tell you mine. I think, I mean, you had a unique, it sounds like you had some imposter syndrome in there, which I totally relate to. And I think a lot of people relate to, especially when you're a first time manager, you might have that like, oh my God, do I really deserve this? How did I get here? Are they going to think I'm a fraud? Um, but you, I think like me, had a unique position of being in in the field of HR and like kind of being in it. And I think that really helped me. So my first management experience was, I kind of think it's like management training wheels. I managed interns and freelancers first before I became like a staff manager. And I think that, that, you know, kind of helped me like dip my toes into the management water. So that helped. And then I think a really, really big benefit for me as a manager is the fact that uh, I cover this stuff all the time. I'm managing people while writing and editing about management and getting all of this advice. So I really kind of have, yes, on the job training, like you said, but, you know, I'm kind of seeped in this topic in a way that a lot of people obviously aren't and have to hopefully come to podcasts like this or, or Fast Company articles to try to, you know, get that information. But what do you think there kind of are common experiences of first time managers and how do they find themselves in the role and, and how prepared are they? And what is it like to be a first time manager that is just kind of thrown into it? Typically brought in in situations where there's a new new manager who has been thrown into a situation because there's been an open position or they've been very productive as an individual contributor, have been very impactful in the organization. And so the company assumes that the individual is ready to move into a manager role. And so they throw them in that situation without giving them enough preparation for the role in terms of how the role is different than their, their individual contributor role. There are expectations uh, that are set for the individual that um, even the individual is just trying to figure out how, how it all works. And so a lot of that I see happening. And since I work with small organizations primarily, there is limited uh, money available for for sending them off on a program, which isn't necessarily what I suggest doing right away. I think new managers need an opportunity to get the experience before they can understand the role of a manager. It gives them an opportunity to get the experience with um, employees that they're working with so that they can get appropriate feedback on how they're performing, how they're managing others, how they're coming across, et cetera. A large part of the learning of a new manager is around getting that feedback and understanding how you impact others. What you said, you know, of, of being promoted because you're a good individual contributor, I think you're right, is so, so common. This is how it works a lot and, you know, doing well in your job and the, the more you kind of get promoted, the further you get promoted away from the thing that you are doing and you default into management and management itself is its own skill set and maybe separate from the skill set that you had as a, as a good, indi uh, you know, individual contributor, as you say, and, and, you know, also not for everybody. But I mentioned the statistic that about half of people who have quit a job have done so because of their manager. So that means that there's a lot of managers out there who are not so great at their jobs. Why is that? Why are so many managers either bad or at least ineffective at their jobs? 
I think there are several reasons for that. Um, we've talked about the first one in terms of being thrown into a role without having enough preparation for it or enough um, discussion with the senior leaders as to what is expected of them in that role. Preparation takes time as well. Organizations aren't necessarily looking at their talent and planning for those open roles. I think in today's environment where everybody's running around like crazy, trying to get things accomplished, have high goals, high expectations, organizations are just run ragged trying to just accomplish what is on their plate today rather than thinking about the future, understanding that we have these employees today who are happy, healthy, and with us and excited to be here, but they may not be here for as long as we think they're going to be here. So there's no succession planning that's being thought through and in terms of what kind of skills and knowledge is going to be required with all the change that's going on. What we find ourselves doing is hiring managers who we think will learn on the job and will take us through these um, rough patches in our organization without thinking about how to ease them into and support them in their role. Once you're a manager in many organizations, you're just expected to come to the meetings and figure out how things work by observing and participating rather than having a mentor or a coach or someone who can help that manager actually look at their own behavior, be, become more self-aware, understand what the role is of, man- of a manager, how that fits into the organization, because traditional roles, are the, there isn't really, I think, a standard definition of here's what a manager is and does. Nowadays, things are so different. You need to be able to adapt that to your own organization. And so there isn't enough of that helping the manager become the best person that they can be in that role. So that's, I think, why why we have what we call so many bad managers. I don't think their intentions are to be bad. If they find themselves in a situation where the environment that's been created for them doesn't allow them to succeed Let's dig kind of more into what you're talking about, about how I loved what you said about this succession plan in place, that it is kind of like, oh, no, this is vacant. This position's vacant. How do we fill it? But what are some other kind of factors that that go into who's getting placed in these management roles? And are we looking at maybe the wrong things? You know, are the are the factors that we are looking for when we hire managers or promote people into management roles, the wrong ones? And also maybe does does office culture play into that at all? There are cases where the person who's getting promoted into the manager role is the one who's the most visible to the senior leaders. They're the ones who are promoting themselves. Uh, They're the ones who are, you know, volunteering for things or making sure that the, the CEO knows who they are. And in situations where companies have a hole to fill and they need to fill it right away, rather than doing a more thorough analysis or assessment of the the talent that they have in the organization, they they will pick the person that they're familiar with. So you do get into situations where the person who's promoted to the role is the one who was best at self-promoting rather than the best person for the job. What employees will do is look around and say, oh, if the company's promoting into management roles, these types of people, then maybe I don't belong here. Maybe I need to go elsewhere where they'll recognize me for my talents and skills rather than my showing up and being visible in whatever way that they try to create that uh, visibility. And when you're saying that, obviously, you know, I'm thinking of that's the the kind of the confirmation bias of this is the type of person that's been a manager before. So this is the type of person that should be a manager. And it just kind of becomes a self-filling prophecy. And, you know, that's how we end up with more CEOs named John than we do, you know, women and people of color. It's just kind of you just keep getting the same sort of person because you decide that that's what a manager looks like. And to your point, it's incredibly detrimental to a company because then you you lose perhaps you know some really good people who say well I guess there's no place for me here because I I see what this company believes is a manager and 
the best people for the role, as you say, aren't necessarily just the ones that are best at self-promotion. Yes. And you bring up a very good point, uh, Kate, that many times senior leaders will actually hire people who are more like them than not like them. And we need more diversity in organizations. It's very important to have diverse thoughts, diverse looks. You don't want to pick people who look like you, act like you, etc. We don't get the kind of richness in organizations and uh, solve problems effectively if we have the same people over and over and over again within the organization. Certainly the foundation of the organization is the values and you need to have people who are aligned with that. But the way that they demonstrate those values doesn't necessarily look the same. So let's go back to the job of management itself and why is management so difficult? You know, we hear a lot about micromanagement. That's like the number one complaint. What are some of the common management complaints and and kind of why do managers fall into those traps? I think the biggest issue is um, setting as a manager, setting up your own expectation that you need to be the expert coming into a role of a manager, the feeling is that they need to have the answer, they're in charge, they need to keep things going and moving. They've got people who are expecting things of them, both who they report to, so senior leaders, as well as employees have different expectations of their managers. They have peers as well that they need to work effectively with. And so there's this um, sense that they can't make any wrong moves. Having achieved a certain level within the organization, those people don't want to lose that opportunity, don't want to lose that position. And so there's this uh, sense of needing to be the expert instead of letting that go and understanding that they are in a position where they're continuously learning and they're a problem solver, they're, they're helping their people become successful in their roles. They can't get the work done on their own anymore. They have to work with people and and get the work done through people. And so their focus needs to move from being the expert to being more of a facilitator or a coach to their employees. And that's a big shift that, that needs to be made. And so bad managers, I think, have a tough time making that shift and letting go of having to make all the decisions and trusting their people. There's a big, big um, step to creating that trust is letting go of your own idea of the way things should get done and allowing employees to actually accomplish that. So being able to set the context for employees as to what needs to be accomplished and then stepping back and letting them get the work done the way that they think it should get done. But I always think like really good managers hire people or or have people on their team that they know are smart, that they know are capable adults and tell them, you know, what they need to know and then get out of their way and trust them to do it the way that, you know, maybe is not their way, but gets it done. And that, you know, that sense of, you know, on the other side of, of people always complain about micromanagers, the other side of what people really value at work, autonomy is a huge part of it and feeling that your boss trust you to to do your job without looking over their shoulder, I think is, is, as you say, is really, really important. Those are critical to effective management. And I uh, believe that with um, managers, they don't necessarily know how to accomplish that. And so the key things to try and, and get at those would be to, for managers to be able to set the context Uh, for them and provide focus. So being more outcomes uh, focused instead of micromanaging. I think what happens, we we heard in Kadeem's uh, situation earlier in the story that he was upset that his manager came in and put up a sign telling people that um, they couldn't have lunch together, the employees couldn't have lunch together. I think there's definitely something that was missing in that relationship and conversation between the manager and Kadeem he didn't understand the context of why that was required of them not to meet. It seemed a a little amiss for me because you want employees to get to know each other and develop a relationship and trust. And so that manager didn't do a very good job of 
uh, helping Kadeem understand why it is that she wanted things to be that way, didn't do a good job of the expectations of also describing to him or discussing with him the expectations around that. And so allowing people to be autonomous, there's definitely some hesitation on a manager's part because they feel like they're losing control of the situation. So how do they step back and keep that sense of trust in their employees? Well, they need to do that by being able to, as I said, set the context for the individual. Why is it that we're doing these things in the organization? How do you personally connect to the outcomes and goals of the organization? And then having that understanding, you can allow people to figure out the way that they believe is best to accomplish those goals and those objectives and those outcomes. And of course, we need to have expectations because every organization has limitations, whether it's financial, legal, physical limitations, et cetera. And so being very clear about the kind of expectations that um, that we all need to live within and boundaries we need to live within then can give managers a little more comfort that people can go off and do things and they all are, are working in the same direction. They're working towards the same goal, but doing it the way that is best done based on their particular situation and how they see the world. Previous time when we talked to you, I think you've, you put it a really great way. I'm going to paraphrase you to you. Great managers explain the why and let their employees figure out the how. So it's that like giving them that that clear communication. You know, I'm like, you know, taking mental notes of the things that you're saying that that kind of that clear communication of why we're doing this, why, you know, in Kadeem's story, why you know, you don't feel that the people can take the lunch at the same time. Like if there was an actual reason behind it and you explained that reason, that would make the, you know, make them feel better about understanding that, you know, as opposed to just being dictated to the clear communication as to the why and then let them figure out the how to get there. And that can extend, you know, as you're saying, like that can extend to allowing flexibility in your work day. That can extend to just like having that trust. So it's that clear communication, that trust. And then I think another part that that we haven't touched on that you mentioned in your article was having empathy, you know, that viewing that people that work for you are people that are, you know, you you want to get to know them and understand their lives and and not just we're not just like work robots that get the job done and that's it. Absolutely. The relationship is one of the most important foundations of managing others, managing your relationships not just people who report to you, but also your colleagues. And I think that that's the piece that managers need to focus more on. And it's um, 75% of their job as a manager. The 25 technical piece, 25% technical piece that they continue to bring with them, of course, needs to get done. But the 75%, they should be focusing on developing that relationship with their employees which to me means understanding how they like to work, what stresses them, what doesn't, getting to know them a little more personally as well about their families and their particular situations because you need to be able to put yourself in their shoes to support them in being the best employee and best workers that they can. Absolutely, the relationship piece is the foundation to creating that trust and letting them then do the how. That's an important part that I think a lot of people would be maybe surprised to hear, but it's so true, is that when you're a manager, as you said, 75% of your job is management and only 25% is that, you know, whatever your field is, the technical skills that maybe got you promoted to be a manager in the first place. But management itself is such an important job that you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a side hustle to your regular job, which I think a lot of people end up viewing it as. Kind of one obvious solution to both bad management and kind of a lack of experience in ending up in a management role is management training. As we talked about, most people don't get any kind of management training. I never got any kind of management training. I kind of gave myself management training by, by uh, you know, on the job and by reading and, and editing the, the articles about it. But since most people don't get any kind of training when they're hired or promoted into a management role, you know, we also know that a lot of the kind of the hate to say it, but a lot of the HR mandated training courses can kind of feel out of touch, aren't that effective. They're just like, here, do this training course. We check this box. Now, now you're compliant. 
Where do management trainings fall short and what's a better approach? The mandated management training programs are definitely an issue in organizations, especially if they're driven by the HR team. Um, that's, that's my experience because it's not considered to be part of the strategic priority of an organization. Um, there are some really good programs out there that teach you the basics of management and um, I think would be very valuable for organizations to look towards, to bring into their company and use it more strategically as part of developing their people such as the Center for Creative Leadership. They have a great program. Um, the Clifton, the Gallup Clifton Strengths as a boss to coach program. That's also wonderful. And so the problem, though, becomes when organizations do the one-off. And so I used to have a senior leader I worked with who, when he ran into issues with uh, his employees, he'd come to me and say, hey, can we send this guy to charm school? And I would always say to him, that's it's not the way to look at it, that we don't just send people on a one-off. The organization needs to make management development, employee development a priority, a strategic priority, because our future depends on the skills and the knowledge that these individuals need to have. And so a more appropriate way to handle management development programs is to do your homework, look at the different programs that are available out there if, if you want to go with something that's sort of pre-designed. If you have the luxury of having an internal strategic HR person who can help design some of the, the pieces of that program, then doing it internally is, is definitely wonderful. Or having that HR manager team up with an external consultant, an external facilitator from that program, bring it into the organization, modify it so that it specifically gets at the, at the values and at the skills and, and um, expertise that are needed in the organization. And so I advocate more for coaching having mentors for your new managers, encouraging them to get mentors even outside the organization, ideally inside, because you want to make sure that there's some consistency with the values and the culture. But um, having also investing in some coaching so that individual managers get what they specifically need within the context of the environment, of their own organizational environment. And you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck. The one very important piece of management development programs that I think bring the biggest value is the feedback piece. All of the great programs have a large segment of the curriculum that looks at creating self-awareness. And the way you create self-awareness is to get feedback from your managers, from your peers, from your direct reports, and sometimes from external stakeholders. It could be a board of directors, uh, it could be a customer, etc. So having the opportunity to understand how you personally impact others around you who you work with is a real gift. And um, many of us as new managers go into it with a lot of trepidation. We don't know how people are going to score us on some of these instruments or these assessments. But what comes out of it is some great transformations. And so those are the, the gems within the management development programs. My preferred approach is to take bits and pieces of that or bring the, the program into the organization and make it yours, making sure that more than just one person goes off to a program. We can't expect them to come back into the organization and be totally different they don't have the support, they don't have the context to apply some of those new skills if you don't have enough people in the organization who come from the same context, have the same background um, opportunity for that. Yeah, it sounds like there's the, you know, the ideal world, you know, where you have this kind of comprehensive training and then the kind of follow up afterwards. And then what's more likely to probably happen at a lot of companies is the one off that's not effective. But if, you know, somebody's listening and they're like, this is not in that kind of comprehensive approach isn't in, in our budget is, isn't realistic for us. Or if somebody is a manager who feels kind of unsupported, it sounds like 
you know, some of the the steps you can take is finding a mentor within your organization or without side of your organization. And the getting the feedback part is really important. And I know really kind of difficult to get honest and actionable feedback, especially from your direct reports if you're a manager. You know, on the other side of that, if you're an employee and you you have a manager that that needs to improve, kind of what what's your advice for people on both sides wanting to get that that feedback and how do they go about getting that feedback? Well, as a manager, definitely making feedback a part of your day-to-day work is important so that employees feel comfortable bringing that information forward. Uh, For instance, even making sure that as part of your meetings, at the end of your meetings, you ask, what went well today at a meeting, at our meeting, and what should we do differently going forward? So asking those questions on an ongoing basis as part of the work that you do gives um, people permission to actually come forward with their ideas. The other piece around giving feedback that I find helpful is making it future focused rather than hashing over the past and what went wrong. It's looking at what can we do differently going forward that would be most effective, that would provide the biggest bang for our buck, et cetera. But it's focused on what you can do differently going forward rather than what you should have done in the past. When you start looking at the past and people feel like fingers are being pointed at them versus uh, looking at what could be done more effectively going forward. That's a great way to frame it that doesn't feel as personal and accusatory, as you say. And I think it just reminds me that, you know, for a long time in our performance reviews, we my favorite part of our performance reviews was a question at the end. How can I be a better manager or or how can I, you know, what what can I do differently sort of thing? And that really gives the opportunity for the employee to say, like, this is how I prefer to work. It would be helpful if you could do this instead, you know. That kind of goes back to to knowing what your employees value, right? Like if they value autonomy, giving them the opportunity to say, you know, this is how I prefer to work. If they value connection, like I don't want an absentee manager. I want somebody who checks in with me kind of regularly or whatever. But giving the opportunity, as you say, to make it future focused, like what can we do differently? What can we do better in the future? And you bring up a great point that not every person is the same. And so when you're managing one employee that maybe needs more direction, they want more direction, versus another employee who likes to operate on their own, maybe has more experience in that particular job. You don't want to manage them the same way because you will make both of them unhappy or one person will be happy, the other one won't be happy. So understanding how your employees, what support your employees need comes with actually asking them. Part of that feedback is, I give you feedback. As a manager, I give you feedback, but I also want feedback from you. And the way that you respond as a manager is very important. If you ignore that feedback, then they're not going to give it to you again. They they won't be open. And so being very self-aware of how you react to feedback. For employees providing feedback to their managers, again, keep it future focused and talk about it in terms of the support that you need from them, rather than telling them they're a bad boss and I wish you did this, this and that. Talk more about, in order for me to be successful in this role, in this project, here's the kind of support I need from you. Or I really would appreciate if you could do X, Y, and Z. And the reason for that is it would help me get this project done in a more timely basis, on a more timely basis, et cetera. So be very specific about what you're, what you're asking your manager to do. And the more you ask specific behaviors, um, the more you'll get what you're looking for. So finally, I can't have a podcast in 2024 and not talk about AI. You know, we've been covering how AI is changing the workplace and changing everyone's jobs. We've also covered how uniquely human skills like management are something that can't be replicated with AI. How do you see AI impacting management and what do you think kind of the future of management holds? Well, AI is definitely upon us and um, it will become even bigger part of our role. I believe that AI is a tool that can help people become more effective in their roles. And so I see AI actually helping managers 
more than than replacing their job, as you say, that human skill, that empathy, that personal touch, it's required. It, we come to work because because of the relationships, because of um, wanting to be in an or, in a place where they feel that where people feel they're connected to others, rather than just a place to come in, get work done, and and leave. People who are in organizations that just come to get work done, they have high turnover. They're looking for a place to be part of something rather than just to get work done. So from the manager's perspective, I think AI can help them coach their employees as to how AI can make those routine jobs more efficient, how they could take those very uh, route type tasks to a minimum so that employees have more opportunities to grow into jobs that allows them to be more impactful, have more meaning. That's a win-win. Not only can you reduce the amount of time that you work on routine things, you can also make better use of your people's talents. Even as a manager, we talked earlier about 25% of your work being more on the technical side or maybe administrative work. AI can help you become more if more effective as a manager by using AI to get the routine stuff done, like budgets and calculations and schedules and research, et cetera. That 25% can get reduced to a lot less by using AI, and you can spend more time as a manager focusing on the people and on the relationships and on the connections that are needed within the organization to accomplish that, those strategic goals that you're there for. That's the reason you're there. That's the hope. Exactly. Yeah, that's the hope and the promise of AI, right? Is that it it frees us up to do the the things, the human things that AI can't do. And I don't know what's what's more human at work than a relationship between a, a manager and, and employees and, and the relationships there. Well, Leah, thank you so much for joining me. This is a lot of great food for thought about good managers and bad managers and, and how to improve it all. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Work is changing every day. What's the most pressing issue on your mind? Email us at podcast at fastcompany.com. The New Way We Work is produced by Julia Shu, Avery Miles, Blake Odom, and Joshua Christensen with editing by Nicholas Torres. 